All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second edition of Conversations on Christianity. Um, tonight we have with us uh, the Reverend Dr. Marcus Carlson, and he's going to be uh, doing a presentation for us entitled Habits of Healthy Churches. Just, just to give you a little bit of background on uh, Dr. Carlson, he's an LCMC pastor, a speaker, consultant, and professor. He's the executive director of Preparing for Amazement Ministries, an organization that seeks to build and revitalize the global Christian church through empowering and equipping churches and leaders for lasting and transformational health. Marcus has over 25 years of ministry experience in a variety of settings. He and his wife, Jessica, excuse me, live in Northeast Indiana and have two teenage children. So, uh, Dr. Carlson, we're glad that you could be with us this evening. Um, before I start us off with prayer, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you do have questions, anyone that's a participant during the presentation, feel free to put those in the chat box, and then we can address those after Dr. Carlson uh, concludes the presentation. Or if you want to ask a live one during the Q&A session, you can do that as well. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer, and uh, then uh, we'll start the presentation. Gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy that you shower down on us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, on this day, Pentecost, we especially thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, as we live this life on mission with you, and as we engage in this presentation and conversation tonight, we pray, come Holy Spirit, and we pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. And, you know, feel free to call me Marcus. I'm pretty simple. Um, yeah, so my wife and I live in Northeast Indiana. He was talking about two teenage children, one of whom, as you were praying, was texting me because for the third night in a row, they want to go out to dinner with my credit card because they're they're in the musical. So it's been a very expensive weekend in the Carlson household with the with the musical. So I'm just going to dive in. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about habits of healthy churches. Uh, and so kind of give you some disclaimers, a little bit of background on where um, I come from on this. And uh, you'll see I'm going to actually share the presentation right to the screen. Uh, so you'll be able to see the slides uh, as I talk in theory when the technology cooperates. And so uh, this for me is a huge, huge passion. Um, and it really uh, comes from some of the things I've seen and experienced. Uh, I've had over a 20 year career in ministry in churches in parachurch and nonprofit settings. I've probably done about every pastoral job in the church except for music minister because I have like no musical ability whatsoever. Uh, and so really for me, this kind of comes from all that background, recognizing that uh, health is a huge factor, and I'll dive into how significant it is in just a moment, not just of churches, but of pastors, uh, that there have been plenty of seasons of my own ministry and plenty of seasons of working with other pastors where um, health has been so complicated and it's hurt their families, it's hurt their ministry. And so just, I have a deep passion for this, a deep passion for health of the church, health of pastors and leaders, uh, a deep passion for caring for pastors. And I haven't nailed this. I haven't nailed this as I often will, uh, you know, again, help churches from a consulting level or do some uh, intentional interim work. And I don't have this nailed as a pastor uh, for myself or even for churches uh, I've led, but just wanting to continue myself uh, to move forward in this. So I just want to dive in and uh, like Jonathan said, you know, save up those questions. Uh, it's easier for me to kind of do those at the end on the Zoom format, if that's all right. So three key realities. First, the, the whole premise of what I'm going to say tonight comes from a book called The Advantage by a, a leadership guru named Patrick Lencioni. If you've never read any of his stuff, listened to any of his stuff, this guy is brilliant. Uh, some of the most successful companies of the last 20 years, like Starbucks and Southwest Airlines, uh, who've been able to reinvent themselves while keeping their core, um, he's worked with them. And so in this book, The Advantage, uh, he's most known for his book, Five Dysfunctions of Teams, but I think that's probably his third best book. Uh, in this book, The Advantage, he says this, in an organization, organizational health trumps everything. 
uh, that organizational health trumps resource, it trumps staffing, it trumps location, it trumps market, you know, whether it's your product or your service. And so really the corollary, and this, by the way, is very true in the church. Uh, the corollary, I would say, though, is uh, in the church, organizational health trumps everything except for the work of God through the gospel. Uh, that, you know, on this Pentecost Sunday, we think of, you know, we think of the work of the Holy Spirit, although we should probably be thinking about that each day instead of just Pentecost. Uh, and so health trumps everything. Uh, so it is more important than your resources, more important than your location, more important than your staffing. Uh, healthy things grow and understand that that's not always numeric. Uh, I think that, you uh, uh, we tend to have an overemphasis uh, in the modern American church on numbers, but numbers are a measure of something, right? And so uh, healthy things grow. It's just the pace at which they grow that changes. But how every healthy thing grows, even, even in our older years, there are things about our bodies that are growing and changing, right? Uh, so that means that uh, one of the ways you can think about uh, what a healthy church looks like is that it's growing. And again, that's not always numeric, but most of the time it is. But the reality is, is that is that primarily that's spiritual. But if you're in a church and you are healthy uh, and you're growing spiritually, then you're going to by default grow numerically almost every single time, unless you literally live in the middle of a cornfield and there are only the same 100 people within like 50 miles, uh, you're, you're gonna see that. Uh, the other thing is nobody wants to be a part of something that's unhealthy. Uh, people leave churches all the time because it's unhealthy. Uh, and the reality is, is that in our day-to-day -day lives, in our work, we have to deal with some unhealthy things. In family, we have to deal with some unhealthy things. So we certainly don't go to the church to volunteer to be a part of something that's unhealthy. And so nobody wants to be a part of something that's, that's unhealthy. And so that, uh, that is huge. And I've seen this over and over again in working with churches. Uh, church I'm working with right now, I mean, they, they had a rapid decline, about half. Um, and just in getting healthy in a nine-month period, they recovered about 50% of that loss. Uh, that health is a, no major changes in, in structure programming, certainly a significant uh, leadership change, but uh, health is a really big deal. And people know when something's unhealthy. So the, the challenge is certainly real for pastors. Uh, so less than 10% of people who at some point in their career are full-time pastors retire as pastors. People don't last uh, as pastors. 29%, uh, and this is a conservative number, we think, 29% of pastors seriously considered leaving ministry in the last year, not just changing jobs or changing roles, but leaving ministry altogether. And again, uh, you know, we can blame that on COVID, but uh, we'll talk about COVID and health a, a little bit later. Uh, burnout is frequent and celebrated, right? We celebrate workaholic pastors. We celebrate workaholic staff. Uh, we, you know, the, 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 the number one violators of the, the Sabbath commandment are people who work at churches. And so, and, and uh, I, I deal with this really almost kind of uh, on a daily basis. And the reality is, is that leaders, leaders either foster health or toxicity. They either foster health or toxicity. This is, this is huge. Um, and if, you're, if you don't know which one you're fostering as a leader, it's toxicity. That's the default. Um, in a fallen world, uh, that's, that's kind of the default. And if you've not noticed, culture is kind of toxic. And so uh, an, an unfortunate reality is, is that the church right now, at least in the United States, is being shaped more by culture than the other way around. And so uh, that's where kind of some of that toxicity comes. Uh, some other things, just thinking about this in terms of COVID, before COVID-19, and I'll show you this visually in a minute, but this is before COVID-19, 70% of US churches were in decline, meaning they're shrinking. 20% of U.S. churches are plateaued, meaning they're remaining flat, right? You know, they gain a person, they lose a person. They gain a person, they lose a person. 9% um, of churches uh, were growing, uh, but by swapping sheep, right? Oh, I left the, the Methodist church for the Lutheran church, or I, I left the church with that really good band for the one with the really cool smoke machine, whatever it might be. Um, you know, or that person made me angry. 
And so now I go here. So 9% of churches grew, but really just by swapping. So really before COVID, only 1% of churches in the US were growing through reaching new people. 1%, that's rough. And again, that's before COVID. So, I mean, you look at that kind of visually, right? I mean, that sliver, that sliver of, of orange uh, is, is the reality in the church pre-COVID, pre-COVID. Uh, so if we talk about kind of the post-COVID world, 40% of churches uh, are at risk of closing this year. And uh, that is somewhat numerical, that is somewhat financial. So uh, a church I'm working with, uh, they've got a lot of challenges, you know, like a lot of churches, you know, if 1950 comes back, they're ready. Or, you know, like a lot of Lutheran churches, if 1850 comes back, they're ready. And so they're, they're struggling. And they've been through a lot of conflict, a lot of crisis. And, and they said, well, somebody asked me, said, how serious is this? And I said, you've got about 10 years left worth of people and 20 years left worth of money. And I think that's what happens in churches. It's like, all right, we got the nest egg, we got the endowment, we don't have a mortgage, we're fine. Um, but when you bleed people at a certain rate, it's very, very difficult. Uh, most churches now, even in areas that are fully open, um, are seeing about 20 to 60% of pre-COVID-19 attendance. And, and, the, and the data shows it's not going to be back to 100% in the next two years, if at all. Uh, and so, uh, and here's the thing about COVID-19, you know, crisis is revelatory and accelerates, right? So crisis reveals a lot about us, right? When we face crisis, uh, we see the, we see our true character come out, you know, what bothers us. We, we see our ability to also persevere and to fight. Uh, crisis reveals the best and the worst in us. Um, you know, I talked about, I've talked frequently about how the pandemic you know, I wondered what it would be like being stranded inside a house for months with my family and a teenage boy and a teenage girl. And it was the best thing that's ever happened to us. Um, you know, we, it was awesome family time. We're closer than we ever could have been running our 500 different directions. Uh, but we had some level of family health. We're not perfect, uh, but we had some level of health. And, and crisis accelerates, right? So for churches that were already unhealthy, once COVID hit, that just, that just accelerated the decline. That just accelerated uh, the unhealth because people really re-examine their priorities. People talk about economics and the, and the labor force issue right now. And it's really easy to try and blame on extra unemployment. But the reality is, is that people really re-examine their priorities. Hey, I'm, not, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice some extra nice stuff at my house versus versus and being home with my family versus, you know, $8 an hour to get screamed at because, you know, the tacos weren't crunchy enough, right? Uh, that people really re-examined. And so, you know, crisis accelerates. So churches that were unhealthy, it went faster. Churches that were healthy excelled. So what we were seeing were churches that kind of were floating. And we saw churches that were on the brink, just a massive drop off in finances. But we saw some churches, including the one that, you know, I attend, we had our best giving year in 25 years, and we made budget for the first time in 10, in COVID, without counting PPP, right? Like in any other assistance. And so crisis really is an accelerator. So it's really an interesting time in the church. Um, I, I would argue that it's probably the most difficult time to do ministry in the church, certainly in the last 70 years, um, maybe the last 100 years or more. So what is church health? Uh, you know, when uh, I use the example of when the Supreme Court was, uh, had a ruling a while back uh, dealing with the issue of pornography, right? How do you define pornography? And basically, you know, the, the premise of their ruling, the, the point of their ruling was, you know, we'll know it when we see it. And I think that's really true with church health. You'll know it when you see it. And health looks different for every church, right? So health looks different for every person. I'm a diabetic. So health for me looks differently than it looks for my non-diabetic wife, right? Uh, health, you know, she's got major heart disease in, our fa in her family. Our tickers are great, right? You know, and so health looks different for each of us. And it's a spectrum, right? Just like everything else, it's kind of a range, you know? So if you've got on this one side, uh, desperately unhealthy and the picture of model health, you know, churches kind of follow in the range. And what I've argued is, what, what I've seen in working with churches is, it's not where you're at on the spectrum, 
but what direction are you moving? Are you moving towards a place of greater health or a place of greater unhealth? And again, if you, the answer is, I don't know, that means unhealth. That the default in our society, the default in the church, the default in just being a sinful, fallen, imperfect world is unhealth. That health does not happen by accident. I, I tried for a decade to lose 20 pounds by accident. I, I found some by accident, but I didn't ever lose any by accident, right? And so, uh, so we know, um, again, health, we know it when we kind of see it. So that's kind of the, the premise, the kind of the, uh, if you will, the building blocks of this. What I want to spend most of the time on is talking about uh, identifying the seven key habits of, of healthy churches. And so uh, these are pretty simple. A lot of them are self-explanatory, and I'll kind of dive into some of them. Some of them, I'll dive into each one, but some of them, you know, I'll talk about it for, you know, a minute. Others will kind of take more time, and you'll understand why. Uh, and these are order. You know, these are in order of significance. Uh, you know, when I've worked, talked about these before, I haven't always done them in order, but I finally put them in order. So first, you know, healthy churches are praying churches. Cliche maybe, but there's more to that. Healthy churches do conflict well. I'll really dive into this one. This is a, this is this is a big one. Uh, healthy churches make decisions in a healthy way. Uh, you know, how we do things, uh, you know, the, the kind of the process, the why, uh, the why will always matter more than the what or the how, always. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of the ways that churches make decisions uh, are not, um, they're not thought out. They're, churches are very reactive places. Churches and schools, um, very, very reactive. I've done a lot of work in public education and private education. And I once had a superintendent of a large school district say, Marcus, what's the difference between church politics and school politics? And I said, school politics are more complicated, church politics are meaner. And he said, isn't that, shouldn't it be the opposite? And by the way, people are meaner uh, to pastors than they are to superintendents. And I said, yeah, he said, well, I'm gonna pray for you. Um, you know, that uh, uh, this is kind of part of the deal. Healthy churches are focused on those outside the church. And I'll really kind of dive into that. Uh, healthy churches value process. Uh, value process, not worship process. And that what churches tend to do is they either tend to uh, worship process or ignore process. Uh, they Churches traditionally um, are not good at this middle ground. Uh, churches, healthy churches focus on adoption over assimilation. And I'll explain what in the world that means. That's probably the most heady of the concepts. And healthy churches, last but certainly not least, are not territorial. Uh, so I'm going to dive into these one by one. And again, just encourage you, um, as you have questions, uh, to kind of write those down. Um, uh, because I you know, look forward to kind of diving into some of this in a more conversational way. So first, healthy churches are praying churches. This is not a cliche. The bottom line is prayer is the biggest factor. Um, that the biggest determinant, not just in the U.S., but I've seen this in Europe and Asia and Africa as well, um, is that, uh, that the biggest indicator of health in a church is whether or not it's a praying church. And again, remember, health is going to, other than the work of God through the gospel, health is the biggest determinant in the effectiveness and the longevity of the church. You go to most churches and you say to the church people, hey, do you want to change? No. Hey, do you want this church to be here for your grandkids and great grandkids? Yes. You know, and those two things are in direct uh, tension with one another. So prayer is the biggest factor and more than just having a prayer team, right? Uh, more than just, you know, having prayers in your worship service uh, or having a prayer event weekly or monthly or yearly, That, but that prayer really is uh, really is a culture. I saw this uh, at church I was working with um, three weeks ago, went through kind of a whole bunch of not happy surprises at once. And what happened was very natural. There was just this sense of reaction and anxiety. But that church over time, it had a pretty good culture of prayer, but it's developed an even healthier culture of prayer. Uh, the initial reaction of anxiety and in, in, in the ideas and the thoughts that came out were really disturbing and concerning and um, scary. Uh, but a night of sleep and prayer, and it was a total change the next morning. 
um, that, that creating that culture of prayer is absolutely essential. And people don't pray for their church. They don't. They're like, oh, it's the church. It doesn't need prayer. They don't think to pray for the church or pray for their pastors. They do when they're mad about something. But I also say that I don't think people pray for their churches because if they really prayed for their church, they, they might find out that they're wrong about something. God might give them an answer that they don't want, you know. And so a lot of times when we're frustrated about something or concerned about something with our church, I think deep down we don't pray about it because we know that God might tell us something that we don't want to hear, that God might challenge us in a way that, that we don't want to hear. It happens to me all the time, Right. Um, like this is this is the story of my life. This is the story of of being in ministry. But how do we develop? Uh, you know, so one church I served, they said well, we want to do this. You know, forty days of prayer before the election. Great. You know, that's fine as long as we don't make it political and we make it neutral. We're good. I mean, let's pray for the election. But don't you think it'd also be worthwhile to pray for our church? You know, and so often uh, the things what we pray for is what we love. What we pray for is what we love. You know, I have an alarm that goes off on my watch four times a day so that I don't lose track of my days and, and I stop and pray. And there is only one thing that I pray for every single time, every single day, my wife and two kids. What we pray for, we love. What we love, we pray for. And so if we're only praying for the election and not praying for our church or our children or our pastors, what does that say? And so uh, healthy churches have a culture of prayer. And not just for getting our wish list in the world or in the problems of our life, but for the church. So it's not, it's not as cliche as it seems, it turns out. Second habit, healthy churches do conflict well. Um, I will tell you that uh, I, um, I spend most of my time dealing with this one. That the vast majority of churches I work with in any capacity are terrible at conflict. This is the, well, if prayer is the most important factor in church health, this is the most common obstacle to church health, is doing conflict well. Um, churches stink at conflict, and that's generous. Uh, it is a disaster, and this tears apart, splits, tears down more churches. This causes more pastors to leave ministry, more people to leave the faith. Um, this causes more toxicity than any of these other habits I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to spend a little more time on this one because this is a big one. Um, you know, every church I've worked with in any capacity, one of the biggest things I've pushed for, one of the things I've used my chips on first is establishing a conflict covenant, right? This is agreement of how we're going to do conflict because how we do conflict is a major indicator of health. And, you know, nobody has ever left a church because they did conflict in, in a healthy way. Nobody has ever left a church because they did conflict in a biblical way. Uh, but boy, people left churches in droves for conflict done poorly, conflict not done at all, which is usually the bigger problem, um, or conflict done in, in, an, in a not biblical way. Uh, so, you know, we as Americans, you know, especially kind of us, you know, boomers and Xers, we like to-do lists, right? We like checklists. You know, we like step-by-step -step instructions. And Jesus very rarely did that. Jesus very rarely gave step-by-step -step instructions, kind of a detailed list, or here's what you do, you know, A, B, C, D. Very rarely talked in stories, and even the disciples couldn't get them, right? What did you mean by that, Jesus? But one of the few times that Jesus talked specifically step by step on how to deal with things was in talking about how to handle conflict and sin in the church. Matthew 18, you'll find it right there, dealing with conflict and sin in the church. Super, super simple, right? So step one, you go to the person directly. In churches, we love to talk about people rather than talk to people, right? Which is the very definition of gossip. We love to talk about people instead of two people, uh, you know, is uh, I've served as senior pastor in a, in a variety of places and, 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 and I've supervised staff for probably the last 15 years of my career. And, uh, you know, I would always tell people, listen, we're going to do conflict the Matthew 18 way. So if somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, youth director Susie did da 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 The first thing that's going to come out of my mouth is, have you talked to Susie? Well, no, I said, sorry, I can't help you. I can't help you. I can't help you. I can't hear you until you talk to Susie. 
unless there is some sexual abuse going on, we there's no conversation. That's the one exception I'll make. You've got to go talk to Susie. Now, if you talk to Susie and it doesn't work out, you're not able to resolve it, then come to me. I'm glad to help, right? So first step, talk to the person directly. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings or, well, they're going to get mad at me or, well, they're going to get defensive. Then obviously it's not important to you and you need to let it go. Obviously, maybe you need to spend some more time in prayer about it if it's not important enough to have a conversation. And I'll tell you, some of the best relationships I've ever had as a pastor in churches are with people who have just come at me in the most awful, nasty, uh, disturbing ways. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've had church ladies threaten to punch me before, for real. And they became some of my closest friends. Why? Because we did the Matthew 18 way. So first, go to the person directly. Second, if that doesn't work, bring somebody else along so that you can solve it together. Remember, Jesus's whole vision for sin and for conflict is reconciliation, not getting a solution, not proving who was right or wrong, you know. And so that mediator, that third person is really just a translator. Their job is not to say, all right, Susie was right and Billy was wrong. But their job is to create this space, right? Create the space for shared language, to, to be a translator uh, so that you can figure this stuff out, not to take sides. So uh, in a church, there's lots of ways that could look. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's one of the pastors. Um, maybe, uh, you know, I encourage a lot of churches to have teams that do conflict and staff care so that you don't intermingle personnel stuff with conflict stuff. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to do that. But that second step is you bring somebody else along to help you find a resolution. Again, not to prove who was right or wrong. We love that in our society. You know, we, you know, if somebody believes, thinks, looks, votes differently than us, all of a sudden they're the enemy. But it turns out that everybody in the universe is a child of God. Everyone in the universe is created to bear the image of God in some way. And so how we do conflict is a reflection on how we value God's children. And so this is a really big deal. So step two, go to the, get another person along. If that doesn't work, it says, bring a group along so that they can be convinced, right? And so again, maybe that's, uh, you know, a couple people from, maybe it's a small group. Maybe again, it's one of these teams in the church is, uh, you know, I like to establish these kind of mutual ministry teams that do this kind of stuff, right? But you get a group to kind of say, all right, we've tried this. We can't figure this out. How do we find resolution and reconciliation? Not everyone get in their way. Not everyone, you know, somebody being, you know, judged right and somebody being judged wrong. But how do we find a way forward? And then it says, the fourth step says, and then it says, if that doesn't work, treat you, treat them as you would, uh, a pagan or a tax collector. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means, you know, it's time to find some separation, right? Uh, you know, so in the church, maybe it's time to help somebody transition to a, to a different church home. It's interesting. I've been applying this model for 15 years. I've only gotten to step three twice. I've only gotten to step four once, and that actually involved physical violence, and it was around mental health illness that was not being treated, right? So, 95 to 99 percent of problems in the church or even between people or in marriage or parenting for that matter they're they're resolved at step one a lot of times it's a miscommunication it's a personality difference you know somebody's tired or grumpy or you know hungry or whatever right um you know a lot of times it's just kind of personalities rub the wrong way this is a really huge deal what most churches do is they avoid conflict Whatever we can do to keep the peace, whatever we can do to keep the most people happy, that is not biblical. It is not healthy, and it is never effective in the long term. It is effective in the short term in many cases. This is the worst of consumerism, right? You know, that the church, particularly in the United States, has become very consumeristic. You know, what is the difference between the church and the McDonald's? Not much, right? Maybe the hours, maybe what they're serving, maybe what they're providing, right? You know, uh, Francis Chan, a, a pastor and author, uh, one of my favorite stories of his was, you know, a parishioner came out to shake his hand after, you know, the sermon and said, you know, she said, Pastor, I got to be honest, I, I didn't really like worship today. And without missing a beat, a brave man, he said, uh, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. 
that there's this mindset in the church that we're there to get pleased, that we're there to consume and kind of become fat and happy. And one of the things that leads to consumerism in the church, one of the things that feeds that monster is avoiding conflict. Well, you know, what? it's not a big deal. You know, we'll just let so-and-so get their way up. We can't do that because that's going to upset people. Listen, Jesus was taking off religious people all the time. You're in good company. I tell churches all the time, if you are, if you do not have at least 10% of your people upset with you at any given time with what you're doing, you're not doing anything. If you have more than 20% of your people upset with you at any given time, you're not listening. And, and so again, what most churches do is they, they, instead of doing conflict the biblical way, they either ignore it, you know, just placate, like the toddler who throws the temper tantrum, right, in, in the grocery store, or they do it the least Christian way possible, which is indirectly behind people's backs, triangulating, right? Um, this is a really big deal. If I could say anything to every church in the world, this is what I would talk about. This is the most practical, the most biblical, the most significant thing in terms of church health right now. And a lot of times in churches, we, we ignore it because we have to deal with it in life and other places. Um, or, you know, we, have, we buy into this nice Christianity, which means that we never say anything difficult or challenging. I mean, it's not anything like Jesus, right? Jesus was so good at comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable over and over and over again. And, and here's the deal. My best relationships are with people who I've had the worst conflicts with. I mean, my best friend, he likes every time we're in a group he, that we're together for the first time, he likes to tell the story of the time in college. I hit him with a spatula, you know, like it's his favorite thing, you know, because we <laughs> this conflict, right? You, you, some of the best relationships come out of the deepest, out of the deepest moments of conflict. This is a really, really, really big deal. This tears down churches faster than anything else. It, it, you know, a lot of times, even churches, pastors, you love the pastor until you don't, until they say no to you, or they do something you don't like, or you don't get your way, and then you don't. I mean, it's it's kind of the the Palm Sunday, Good Friday paradigm, you know, the, the, you know, Hosanna, you know, Hosanna, Jesus, pastor in the highest, and, but it's the same crowd, you know, five days later on Friday that's saying crucify him, crucify him. And that's kind of what happens in the church. We let it build or we ignore it or, you know, we gossip about it and, and we convince ourselves that somehow this is, this is okay. Well, it's toxic. And it's why the world looks at us and goes, why do we want to be a part of that? I mean, I did that in middle school. You know, why would I, you know, why would I do that, you know, voluntarily as an adult? So this one I hit on hard um, because I will tell you, it kills more churches than anything I'll talk about tonight, hands down. Um, absolutely hands down. Uh, it's aged me more than anything in ministry too. Uh, number three, healthy churches make decisions in a healthy way. Um, churches tend to be reactive, right? Oh, you know, somebody ruined the sidewalk with their skateboard. Let's have a skateboarding policy. Oh, you know, somebody, I remember a church I served, I my, like my first week, and uh, the, the head of the property team came into my office. And in my office, I had put a mini fridge and a microwave. And he comes in and he says, why do you have that here? And I said, well, you know, it's just easier to grab my lunch. I don't have to put it, you know, down. So you can't eat on this level of the church. And I look at the carpet and go, clearly that's not true. And I, and I, I said, what do you mean? Well, you know, we just had problems with, with, one, with one staff member. So we just don't allow eating on this level of the floor. I said, well, you do realize it's a hospital, not a museum, right? You know, and they weren't tracking, so I explained that a little bit. And, and I said, uh, okay, so where's this policy? Well, it's just a policy. And I said, well, I've looked through all the policies. Where is it? Well, the property team made it. I said, well, okay. I said, usually policies have got to be approved by a council. So let's figure it out, right? Churches are super, super, super reactive. Uh, churches should have few policies and lots of procedures. Um, and, and really, um, how we make decisions is really important. Are we reacting or are we reflecting? It's one or the other. The why is far more important than the what or the how. 
Because if you've got a good why and you get it wrong, then you can learn something. Then people can understand. They can say, hey, we saw what you're doing. When you have a good why, you can agree to disagree. But when you focus on the method, when you focus on the what, when you focus on the how, and you get it wrong, and you've got a terrible why, a selfish why, a manipulative why, which is often the case, it's destruction everywhere. It's destruct. I mean, churches are terrible about focusing on method over mission. And, and this is again. So are we doing the are we doing this for the right reason, the right way to the best of our ability? Is this the right thing? Do we have a right reason, right way, and to the best of our ability? And it's amazing when you do this and to help. I've had the privilege of helping lots of church boards and staffs figure out how to do this. It's amazing what happens when you do this, right? I'm an amazing, it's amazing. I do kind of this separate piece on what a church leadership structure looks like. It's amazing when you empower your staff and your teams, right? And you empower your boards to do the big picture stuff. That if you're talking about carpet color in a board meeting, then it's, then you're in trouble, right? You're, you're in trouble that, you know, that's, and, and that never works out well, by the way. I've seen people throw chairs over that stuff. Um, you know, so, so kind of the filter, right? What's the filter? Obviously, the first filter is scripture. Scripture is the lens. Scripture is the primary lens. We cannot do things that are contrary to scripture. But the reality is, is that scripture is not specific on everything. And two faithful Christians can read the same passage and understand it differently. So then what do we look to next? Well, we got to honor our heritage. You know, uh, we honor our heritage, our identity. Maybe that's our denomination. Maybe that's, you know, deeper than that. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't throw that away, but we shouldn't worship that. I mean, Luther himself said, you know, I, I don't want you, you call yourselves Lutherans. I'd rather call you call yourself Christians. So, you know, recognizing our heritage. But then mission and identity, right? Does this help us achieve our mission? Is this consistent with who we are? Now, again, most churches don't have a mission that they take seriously, or they don't know their identity, um, but it's mission and identity. Usually, though, this is how it goes. Well, we've got a problem. So what's the easiest solution that upsets the least amount of people or upsets the least amount of large givers or noisy people? But that's not healthy, right? And by the way, super effective again in the short term, very effective. Uh, ineffective in the long term. This is this is what causes that plateauing, right? Um, no matter what people say, they don't. You know, my kids. No matter what they say, they don't want me to say yes to everything. They really don't. In their heart of hearts, they don't want me to say yes to everything. And and so and and again, just before this, learning that you know, my son's like, hey, dad third night in a row. I understand if I can't go, if I'm eating too much into your bank account, but can I go? Um, again, you know, we've got it. We've got to help people kind of think, kind of think through these things. What is, how are we making our decision? Churches, some churches just chase the newest fad or the newest small group curriculum or the newest tool or the newest idea. And, and it's like the dog chasing its tail. It's fun for a while, but it doesn't necessarily get you anywhere. So how do we make these decisions, you know, the right decision, the right reason, the right way to the best of our ability? How do we, you know, use scripture as our primary filter, but then again, look at heritage, mission, and identity. Number four, uh, healthy churches are focused on those outside the church. So healthy churches, to say this a little bit uh, in a longer sentence, Healthy churches are focused primarily on those outside of the church. That doesn't mean they ignore those inside of the church. Every time I talk about this, well, what about me, right? I mean, because we're consumers, right? You know, it's all about us. What about me? The church is the only institution in the history of the world that exists primarily for those outside of the institution. That the whole purpose of the church is to reach people for Jesus. Now, again, that does not mean that we ignore caring for the people inside of our church. But here's the interesting thing. When, when we focus on, on the outside, when we focus outside of the church, our people inside the church grow. And it turns out that people inside the church are actually really good at taking care of one another. And so when you, when you, 
the focus externally, even, even as a human being, right? You know, I could pick two days in my week, one day where I was in really good spirits and really focused and really listening to the spirit. And one day where like, you know, the world is ending, I'm grumpy, I'm short with people and, you know, nothing's going well. The difference um, was some sleep and my focus. The day that I was struggling, I was thinking mostly about me. The day that I wasn't, I was thinking mostly about other people that there's something inherently that God has created in us, you know, that we are, I mean, think about mission trips, right? Or service projects, any of that stuff you've done, you go, man, I got more out of this than I felt like I gave, right? That this is how God has created us. And the church exists primarily for those outside the church. It's a balance, but I'll tell you at the bare minimum, two thirds of your efforts should be on those outside the church and one third inside church. That's as that one third is as big as you can go. And I would argue it probably needs to be smaller, um, but it takes time to get there. You, sometimes you got to train your church folks to care for one another. But here's the reality uh, that one of my friends likes to say is, you know, mature Christians set aside their preferences for less mature Christians. That's what it means to be a mature disciple. So this focusing on the inside of the church versus the outside of the church is not a programmatic issue. It's, somewhat of an education issue, but it's primarily a spiritual maturity issue. That consumerism in the church isn't just a cultural issue, it's a spiritual maturity issue. That here's the reality, my parents set aside a lot of their preferences to give me the life they gave me. I as a parent set aside a lot of my preferences to do what's best for my kids or to give my kids my very best. This is how we were designed that those who are mature in the faith set aside their preferences for those who are less mature or new to the faith. And churches that get this grow always. They grow over and over and over again, they grow. So, um, so that's number four. It's, that's, that's, a, that's one that trips us up, you know, the but what about me syndrome. Uh, healthy churches value process. Uh, and this kind of goes back to how we make decisions, but also how we do things, right? We tend to under-process conflict and over-process everything else in the church. I've seen this all the time. You know, we under-process conflict and we over-process everything else. We will move through a conflict in five minutes because we're uncomfortable, don't want to talk about it, but we'll spend 10 years on a constitution that we look at once every 10 years. Uh, we tend to under-process conflict over process, everything else. Process allows for learning, right? If we have process, we allow, we allow for learning and it protects us from this reactionary kind of behavior. We actually implement some of this in my house, right? It helps us to be, it doesn't work all the time. Teenagers, marriage, you know, doesn't always work, but you know, we really tried to, to do this, right? Because what we tend to do as human beings especially now in our very divided culture, is we make emotional decisions and then we backfill them with logic. Or worse yet, we make an emotional selfish decision and we backfill it with scripture. And so over and over again, we kind of do this. And again, we focus on reactions and we focus on mission over methods. But here's the deal. Like a lot of stuff I do with churches, when I come into churches, a lot of times there's been a major conflict, usually between a staff person, the lead pastor, a board. And so one of the things I try to do is say, let's build process so that if you have a pastor that maybe maybe checks out or maybe gets sick and stops performing well, or maybe has actually got some character issues, it doesn't have to destroy you. Or maybe you get a bad board or a bad council, or maybe, you know, maybe you have a bad year, right? And, and, but if you've got process, that prevents this all from being dictated by one personality, by one season, uh, by one challenge. Discipleship is a process, right? Discipleship is a journey. Following Jesus is a process. It, it, it is, you know, it, in process allows us, it helps us to deal with change. It allows us to learn. And again, if we fail with a process, we've got some funny stories, we've got some learnings. If we fail without a process, we've got hurt feelings, we've got confusion, we've got destruction, sometimes death, really, quite frankly. Um, you know, that process matters so much. Process matters more than results uh, because healthy process with a bad result is fixable. No process with a bad result is a disaster. 
And so this is kind of uh, the, the key to habit number five. Habit number six, healthy churches focus on adoption over assimilation. What in the world does that mean? Uh, baptism, particularly the, you know, the Lutheran understanding of baptism is really, really helpful here. You know, that in baptism, we are being adopted into God's family. You know, I love the passage uh, of Jesus's baptism, right? You know, the voice, the skies open up, the voice from heaven says, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. I get chills even just saying it still, right? And we think that that is just about Jesus, and it is about Jesus, but what it's meant to also to be is about us. Hey, this is my son, Marcus. This is my daughter, Abby, whom I love, with whom, in spite of their worst moments, I am well pleased. That what God does is God adopts us into his family. So there's kind of the old approach to the church, the very modern approach to churches, believe what we believe, behave how we behave, which also includes dressing how we dress, then you can belong. That's assimilation, right? To assimilate says, come and be like us. Come, believe what we believe, behave the way we tell you, we'll fix you, then you can belong to this church family, then you can belong to God's family, that's assimilation. Again, Jesus's model is an adoption model, right? In adoption, we're saying, you know, if you've ever adopted a child or a pet or whatever, or know somebody who has, right? You're, you're, you're going to this child and saying, I'm choosing you just as you are to be a part of my family. And that's the model of baptism, right? That's the model of the gospel. That's the model of Jesus. And so that where that starts is you belong because you were a child of God. We help you to believe in that resurrected God, and we let Jesus deal with your behavior, right? We love to do behavior modification in the church, not our own, just other people's behavior modification. We love to do behavior modification in the church, but the reality is, is that I'm not in charge of anyone else's behavior modification unless they ask me to be, or they happen to be my son or daughter, and even then that's limited. Right, But we think as the church, our primary job is to get everybody to behave like us. But none of us are perfect, so that's really dangerous, right? That's really, really dangerous. I hope to God every day that my kids are better than I am. I pray daily that my kids are better than I am. Just like my parents hoped that I would be better than they were. Right? That's just called good parenting. So this idea of adoption is you belong because you are a child of God. Let us help you believe in this Jesus who's changed our life and we'll let him deal with your behavior, right? The only thing I'm supposed to hate in this world is my own sin. This love the sinner, hate the sin nonsense. It's not, it's, it's terrible. It's not good theology. Love everyone, hate your own sin. This is kind of the model of adoption. Remember, the Holy Spirit is in charge of behavior modification. Not us, not the church, not me. Even in those relationships, I can only do so much, right? I can only help my kid to behave a certain way. The reality is, is I don't have full control over that as much as I'd like to most days of the week. So healthy churches, they focus on a, an adoption approach over an assimilation approach. Come you are welcome as you are, child of God, to be a part of our family. Let me introduce you to Jesus. Number seven, uh, this is uh, the smallest one, but not insignificant. Healthy churches are not territorial. Now, there's always some territorialism in the church. Uh, I remember the first church I served full-time, the first board meeting I was at, they were arguing about the size of the plaque that would go on the uh, mini fridge in the adult Sunday school room donated by somebody, right? And it got so heated, this 82-year-old man got up, picked up his chair, and threw it at somebody. This is my first board meeting full-time as somebody in ministry. I'd like to tell you, it's the only time I've seen that. Um, you know, we get super territorial, and every church has have those places, right? One church I served, it was the sacristy, right? You know? I put bottled water in there for the pastors and musicians, and you would have thought I took the baby Jesus from the manger and hit him, right? Like, I mean, it was hardcore. Uh, one church I'm working with right now, 
they've had a lot of territorial issues over the stage in the gym, you know, sharing it with the preschool and with the children's ministry and with the modern worship service and musicians, they can be kind of princesses sometimes, right? I mean, you know, but, you know, my dad always said, what, what? He was late to, he came to faith after I did. He said, Marcus, I've learned one thing. Watch out for the church M&Ms, music and money. And I said, in buildings, right? That, that we get super territorial. It's all God's stuff, not ours. Everything that we have, you know, and a lot of times we're like, all right, uh, this is my stuff. How much should I give to God? But really what we should be looking at is saying, God's given to me this to me. How much should I be allowed to keep? That everything in the church belongs to God, not to the person that donated it, um, you know, that the nature of our job is stewardship, that it's God's stuff, not ours. I remind people all the time uh, that in the church, everything except for people's individual offices is a shared space. Everything is a shared space. If, if things are not a shared space, you are wasting a resource that God has given you. So other than personal offices, everything is a shared space. Everything is a shared space. It turns out that Christians can be worse than preschoolers at sharing. We have a lot of idolatry around our building. We worship our buildings. And we even see this post-COVID. How quickly can we get people back into our buildings? The early church didn't even have buildings. And so this, this again, this, is, this kind of gets to be idolatry. That uh, The less territorialism you have, the healthier you are. It's not the only factor, but it is a factor. And, and, and territorialism is created oftentimes by a lack of communication, a lack of hope, a lack of process, um, a lack of people having input. There's a lot of things that create it. One of my favorite stories I ever experienced in a church was uh, we were uh, reworking the sanctuary a little bit. And there was on the back wall of the sanctuary, this beautiful stained glass clock with no Roman numerals. It had been do donated in 1976. Um, and it even had a huge plaque on the underneath of it, you know, plastic plaque on this beautiful wood carved, you know, stained glass clock, typical church. And uh, we decided to take it down from the spot in the sanctuary um, because it was hard for us to read from the front and watch our time for worship uh, and to put it in the chapel, which was a really much more sacred, prayerful, less multi-purpose space. And being that the person that donated died a long time ago, it was donated before I was born. Um, you know, we, we did that and word got around to a long lost relative that we had done that. And they had every relative calling every pastor and every council member, how dare we move that clock? And when we explained, hey, this is why, and we still wanna value it. And this is where we hung it. I kid you not, they drove to the church and took the clock back. I mean, it was donated before I was born. Like, you know, when you donate something, you donate it, right? Like if I donated my car to like the Salvation Army, I couldn't five years later go, where's my car? I need to use it to go to the store. But this is, this is kind of the, this is kind of the, um, the idolatry that, that we get into. So healthy churches are not territorial. Um, and territorial is always about space and product, you know. Well, that is the altar guilds table. All right, well, we don't have room for 47 tables for each ministry. So how do we learn how to share a table? Um, this is the stuff that pastors get to deal with all the time. Uh, just kind of one final thought before we go to questions. You know, culture is everything. You know, that health is not a program. Um, even these seven habits, these are cultural things. You know, you can only build so much of these into your policies and procedures and programs that really at the end of the day, um, it's all cultural stuff. And cultural change is the hardest, but the most exciting and the most transformative kind of change. That health is, is about culture, creating a culture of health. How do we create cultures of health in our families, in our marriages, in our churches? Because at the end of the day, outside of the work of God through the gospel, health trumps everything in the church. And you don't have to be rich. You don't have to be have you know multiple doctoral degrees. You don't have to have the best location. Anyone, any church, any leader can do health. Any place, any family, any organization can move the needle on health, right? 
Um, you know, again, for me, I, I can ex I can explain that emotionally and physically and relationally, right? In the church, it's a culture thing. Do you have a culture of health? Do you have a culture uh, that pushes health? So that's kind of the quick, you know, fire hydrant uh, version um, of the seven habits of, of healthy churches. So um, questions for me, I'll probably come out of screen share so that um, it's easier to see each other. Questions about uh, habits of healthy churches, maybe some of these issues, some of these stories that I brought up, either you can do them out loud or in the chat. So, so Marcus, thank you for spending some time with us um, and sharing this. How would you encourage a community that would maybe look at these seven habits and like any community kind of do an inventory and go, okay, clearly this might be one area or we have three areas or even, you know, um, how would you encourage a community like how to start? Because I think what I can envision is a sense where some of this can feel overwhelming and we try to like retro, it's not that we just wanna get healthy presently, but I think the temptation to try to retroactively try to sort of uh, fix it and then move forward. So, so kind of with that and understanding what you've just laid out with the churches that you have been working with, how would you encourage a particular community to, to, to like when, they, when clearly there's something that we could work towards in terms of a greater sense of health, um, how do you navigate the, you know, sort of addressing what led up to that, but then leaning into that present moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly though, you know, Churchill said those that don't know their history are doomed to repeat it, right? So there is some examination of history. I mean, my encouragement is to, is to look at the list and say, all right, which of these two or three do we struggle with the most? And start at those top ones, right? You know, um, stop, start at those most impactful ones. And I don't think belabor, you know, what's caused you to struggle because the reality is it's just a culture that was created, right? It was, it was a culture that was created. And so, um, you, you know, you've just got to name it and say that's the culture that was created unless the, there's a person in there that's still working hard to create it, you know, living in that history is not significant. If there is, then you've got to deal with that person usually or that group. So like for the example of conflict to say, all right, how do we, um, gosh, we're terrible at this. You know, we're a church and we're ignoring the scripture. Um, and again, this is the most common one that churches stink at, so I can pick on this one. So to say, all right, how do we create that culture? Um, gosh, you know, you know, all right, let's create, this is a part of our DNA, right? Our conflict covenant in our churches should be on the level of our constitution and bylaws, right? Um, you know, it's not just a policy. So, for example, I just did a church I've been working with to kind of get them to a, a kind of a reasonable place of health to kind of almost restart. Um, you know, we did a conflict covenant and we made all the staff sign off on it recently, right? Um, so, you know, we make this covenant real. And so I preach the covenant. In fact, every church, I, one church I served for seven years, I preached conflict covenant once a year wrote about it in the newsletter once a year, right? That there's this sense of education, but at the end of the day, you've got to have buy-in from your leaders, your staff and your board, right? And so, um, so you can't be like, all right, we're going to honor conflict. And then an angry congregation member goes to board, mem board member A and says, you know, I don't like that Mario, you know, name one of the many annoying things that Mario did. And, and, and the board member goes, you know, I'll talk to him. No, like time out. Uh, one church I served, we had this lady, she'd sit in the back, and every week, like clockwork, she would write an anonymous note about the things she didn't like in worship and slip it under the door of the office. And so when I get notes, I, op I open them up and I look to see if there's a name on the top or the bottom. If there's not, I just do a quick scan for the word abuse. I won't read them if they're anonymous. They go in my special T file for trash, right? That, that part of this is saying that we're going to be deeply committed to this, right? We're going to hold one, one another accountable to this. Um, you know, prayer, right? You know, hey, how do we really, again, it's, it's an education piece. It's a modeling piece. 
it's a you know it's a programmatic kind of policy piece whatever it might be you know so with conflict covenant it's kind of more policy with prayer it's more programmatic right so so how do we really build up the prayer team how do we really kind of focus on kind of this mindset how do we you know i i would argue most churches should have a 40 days of prayer for the church every year right where you're stopping and praying for the church uh, every day, because what we love, we pray for. And what we pray for is what we love. And so again, I think a lot of it is just kind of building the habit saying, all right, we've not done well at this. And maybe here's the one or two reasons why, but how do we fix this going forward? And having that accountability to say, we're all bought in. Um, in fact, one church I was working with, uh, when we, the, the week after we adopted the conflict covenant, one of the council members violated it and violated it with me. And I was not pleased. Uh, in fact, I just said, listen, if you're not going to take this seriously, I can't help you. Like, I'm out. You, If you cannot take this seriously. And so the council president was like, oh, my goodness, we're going to lose this guy. And what do I do? But I can't triangulate and I can't go to the person. And he said the most fascinating thing. He said, Marcus, you've got to understand we're dealing with muscle memory. So there's, there's a sense where you've got to kind of be patient, right? Like you've got to, you've got to be able to, to let people adjust and kind of learn it, but you also can't excuse it. Now, before I could go to the person and deal with it, they came to me and said, listen, I was a jerk. I, old habits die hard. I freaked out. I, you know, and it was a beautiful moment. And I'm closer to that council member than probably almost every other council member. Uh, but it wasn't pretty and people got hurt me in particular. Uh, and so you've just got to foster that culture where it says we are going to be committed to doing things the way of Jesus, no matter how hard it is. And no matter how messy that might be in the short term, we're going to do things the way of Jesus, because we know, we believe that in the long term, the kingdom way is the right way. I'm not making this up. I mean, it's there in detail. And so, um, so I think those are kind of some of the things that I would suggest. Um, if you want to know how well you're doing at these things, don't ask yourself. Ask some people who have left recently. Um, ask some people who've moved away. Bring in somebody from the outside to, to look. I mean, outside set of eyes are really, really powerful. Um, they just see things that you don't see. You're like, oh, I had no idea we were doing that way. Oh, I never thought of that before, right? Um, we're so afraid to let somebody else kind of look in our underwear drawer, but we, we miss an opportunity to get an outside perspective. So those would be kind of the initial things I would say, um, you know, the long answer in response to your long question to pastors. Other questions? Don't go too easy on me. Marcus, you were talking about outside perspective. And one of the things that I could sort of see weave throughout all of this is, is a self-awareness type of reality. And you were talking about how, you know, with COVID, but any type of crisis serves as a revealer and an accelerant. Um, with COVID, do you think... Uh, churches are, are, will be forced to have more self-awareness or do you think there'll be more aversion to that or is it case by case basis or what, what have you seen from your field work and, and what other experts are, are looking at? Yeah, I mean, I would say it is case by case, but here's the thing. I think that self-knowledge, certainly from like a discipleship perspective and from a leadership perspective is not a tool in the toolbox. It is the toolbox. Um, and so self-knowledge is a really, really big deal. Um, and I need people in my life because I see myself with rose colored glasses. Like we judge ourselves by our intentions. We judge other people by their actions. Right. And so we always kind of have these rose colored glasses towards ourselves. And we always have kind of these dark colored glasses towards everybody else. Will COVID force churches to be reflective? No, I think churches are infamous for having their heads in the sand. I, I mean, you know, the, you know, the, the ostrich flamingo syndrome, whatever you want to call it, but like churches are notorious for having their heads in the sand. But I will tell you, churches that don't um, do some self-reflection in the midst of this crisis 
are are going to struggle to be around 10, 20 years around from now, depending on how much money and people they have. Uh, and I think what happened with a lot of pastors and churches was churches just said, all right, well, we've just got online. Let's do more, 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 more. When Jesus gave us on a silver platter this opportunity to do less, I mean, Jesus, you know, like, I mean, seriously, he would, his job description would not fly past most church boards. Um, you know, wander around, talk to people, heal some people, take a nap. Uh, I mean, it sounds fantastic, actually. Uh, you know, so he, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't survive in any American church for probably five minutes. Uh, and so, you know, I think there has to be um, self-reflection because we just did more pastors, right? They had this opportunity to actually embrace Sabbath and rest and care for their families. And they just worked harder from home to prove that they deserve their paycheck still. And so we've got pastors burning out at a record rate and we've got churches closing at a record rate. And I'm telling you right now, it's not just because of economics. It's because we took this crisis and we wasted it. We wasted it. You know that every crisis presents challenges and opportunities. And all we did was look at the challenges and how do we numb the challenges? How do we treat the symptoms instead of treating the issues? And so instead of actually being able to decrease pastoral burnout and increase pastoral health, in the American church, we just decimated pastors. We just, just, but just do more. You know, you are now, uh, you know, are, you are now a Zoom evangelist on top of everything else. Um, and it was really sad. It's still, it's still really, really sad. So yeah, I mean, I think that self-reflection is really critical. I think that it's not too late to leverage the opportunities of COVID to really say what are our priorities. You know, what is the spirit telling us to do, not what is everyone else doing, or not what is the 42,000 things that we can do to make everyone else happy. Hey, everybody was burned out before COVID, but let's take the emotional exhaustion of COVID and give people more things to do and more things to come to. Um, crazy, 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 crazy stuff. Um, so I'm going to look at some of these chat things here. Um, yeah, I think many don't know uh, how to pray. And, and I think that, you know, Preaching on prayer is really critical, right? That prayer is just conversation with God uh, and, you know, to teach people to kind of have that innocence of the child. Uh, what's one of the reasons whenever I do children's time in a church, I do repeating prayers um, because it almost kind of teaches people. And I do very short sentence, very childish, childlike prayers, you know, because it kind of creates this culture. My favorite moment, my favorite thought on prayer came when Mother Teresa was being interviewed one day by one of the like, you know, ABC, NBC, one of the major regular news stations uh, back before we had all these wackadoo cable news things. And so uh, the, the newscaster was just really curious about the spiritual life of the spiritual diet. And he said, so, you know, Mother Teresa, when you pray, what do you say to God? Right. Good question. Right. Like, what does this prayer giant have to say? And in her very Mother Teresa way, she kind of just stopped and looked up and said, nothing. I just listen. And so he was kind of like, you know, like trying to recover, like, you know, not the answer he was expecting. He's like, okay, okay. Oh, good. You know, you know, not, not knowing what to do with this, right? And he says, well, okay, Mother Teresa, when you pray, what does God say to you? And she says, nothing. He just listens. And I think that we tend to overcomplicate all this stuff, you know, all right, well, McDonald's has added 17 sandwiches to the menu. So let's add 17 services to our church, right? That'll do it. If we just do more stuff, people will come, you know, if you keep them busy, they will come. That worked great from 1950 to 1975. It's not worked since. And I'll tell you as Generation Xer, we don't care about busyness. We care about work-life balance. And millennials definitely don't care about busyness. And Generation Z will be the same, the same as they are. So I had another question I think came up uh, uh, about conflict. Does how personal disposition can affect conflict leadership? Absolutely. I mean, fight or flight, right? There are some people who are so crippled by conflict that doing this in the biblical way is very, very hard. Um, and there are some people that like conflict maybe a little too much, you know, like. I, you know, I will look for ways to just 
agitate and instigate with my wife. Like it's, I just find joy in it. Right. And so, you know, we'll be checking out and she'll pull out the credit card and I'll say, not that one, that's not ours, you know? And, and then she's got to get her ID out and all, you know, cause it's funny and it's fun for me, you know? So, but anybody who likes conflict is, is mentally ill, right? Like that, that nobody loves conflict. Um, even those that do it well. And, and it's true that there is, it is a fight or flight kind of a mindset. So I think first, if you have somebody who's adverse to conflict um, or somebody who enjoys it a little too much, I think you go back to the same thing, right? The Matthew 18 thing. This is not about you. This is about doing this the right way. And I think when you have somebody who's conflict adverse, you've just got to be able to name it and say, hey, I know, Bill, that you really don't like doing conflict. So what can I do to help you do this well? What can we build into the system that will help us to do this well so that you can do that? And it's raising from the front to say, we refuse, we refuse to do conflict in any way that's not biblical. So in this church I was serving, um, even though people know better, this church I've been helping, uh, I said, um, I said, uh, oh, my default speaker is changing. Uh, we hired a new custodian and there was all sorts of issues. So when I was doing my initial consult with them, like I had to fire lots of people. And, and so we had to hire a church custodian and we have these women in the church who are very passionate about certain areas. I know that sounds familiar. And so at the start, there's been some times where his work has not met their standards. Fair enough. Guys learning his job. And so what they should do is say, Hey, Kirk, we don't like how this looks you know, do you have enough time? Can we help you? But, or is this just something we need to, you know, better understand? Is this not on your list? You know, what can we do? Uh, you know, instead, chitter chatter, right? You know, all the clucking, you know, the clucking going around. And so then they go to the property team and say, this isn't getting cleaned. And the council liaisons on the property team and they're saying, you need to take this to council. And I'm going, council should not talk about that crap, right? You have a conflict covenant, you have staff supervision. So it comes on council and the guy brings it up. He was new. He wasn't there when we did the conflict covenant. I said, time out. Conversation's over. It's over. Have they talked to Kirk? Nope. Sorry, we can't talk about it. If they go to talk to Kirk and it doesn't work, they come to me. And if it doesn't work then, then, then we'll talk about it or the personnel team will talk about it. But until then, no conversation. You've got to remind them, we're going to do this the Jesus way. Next month. Well, I brought that up, but they still said they wanted me to bring it up to council. And I said, I'm not going to tell you again. And another council member said, we're not going to talk about this again. And so I'm going to sit down with, I know who it is, right? So I'm going to say, listen, I'm just going to remind you that this is the way we're going to have to do it. And if you're not comfortable doing that, this is not important enough to you, or you need to pray. Uh, and, and so you've got to build into the culture to say, we are not going to make these exceptions, right? We are going to hold fast to the scripture. You know, we all are proud of ourselves in the LCMC of holding fast to the scripture, except for this one. Um, how does a church prevent pastor burnout? Um, yeah, it's great. Uh, I think job descriptions are important and no job description in a church should other have these words, other duties as assigned. Um, I think that having a team, uh, I call them mutual ministry, and the team that does, they have two jobs. One, they're the group that mediates conflict when it gets to a group level. And two, they check in on pastors and staff at least once a year. They sit down with them and say, how you doing? How's your family? How's your marriage? You know, are you getting the support you need? Um, are you getting the encouragement you need? I think also churches need to force pastors to take their time off. Churches need to force sabbaticals. One of the things I love about my home church is they built a habit um, when they have had a staff person have a performance issue or even a character issue, their first response is to force a sabbatical. Um, you know, one of the things that churches have been doing, and I love it, is that post COVID, even in the midst of COVID, forcing sabbaticals, that every church across the United States should, should force every pastor and every full-time staff member, not at the same time, to take at least a one-month sabbatical. 
just to recover from COVID, just to find Jesus again, just to find family. Um, listen, pastors have a need to be needed. They have a martyr syndrome. They get addicted to kind of the, the attention. If you've got a pastor in your church that's not done sabbatical ever or long, you know, that's a, that's a biblical issue, right? I mean, this idea of Sabbath even, you know, my Sabbath is very simple. Thir my Sabbath is Friday. So Thursday night, when I get home, I turn off my email and all of my devices. I put my phone on do not disturb. And I don't turn it back on until Saturday morning. If it was good enough for Jesus, if it was good enough for the creator God, if it made the top 10 list of commandments, then who am I to think that I should not Sabbath? And so pastors, churches should force their staff and their pastors to Sabbath. I've actually written staff up for not Sabbathing. See, it's one of the very few things that I've ever had to write staff people up for. It's not a suggestion. It's not a one week every year. It's a one every seven. And listen, I've been doing this a long time. Have people died on Friday? Have there been a crisis? Once or twice. And there was a way for somebody to get me in that emergency. You know what I did? I handled it and I made up the Sabbath next week by taking an extra one. Have I had to do funerals on my Sabbath? Yes. Yeah. So say, all right, hey, office, I'm taking Sabbath on Thursday this week because I've got a funeral on Friday. Right. So there is, so you've got to force these biblical habits, these, you know, I mean, like the reality is like, I'm not the Christ and there's no pastor that is the Christ. So who are we to think this Jesus who needed rest, this father who rested, this, this thing that made the list, right? I mean, you know, after, I mean, pretty early on in the list, quite frankly, but pastors have a need to be needed. We've created a workaholic culture in churches. We've created a workaholic culture and professional ministries. And what we're modeling to our congregations and what we're modeling to our families is, is deeply disturbing. Um, that, that me saying no to things was always the way for my kids to know that I love them more than the church. Um, that was always the way. And I remember, you know, one church, it was hard for that small church, you know, the pastor's always available. No, no, Jesus is always available, but that's it. I'm not Jesus. And so, you know, even that was a trick, but boy, seven years later, you know, I remember the financial secretary marching into my office one Thursday and she said, I'm done. I said, no, you're not, you're not quitting. Um, you're not quitting at all. She said, no, I'm done not taking Sabbath. From now on, no checks, no deposits, no financial questions on Friday. Do you understand me? <laughs> it was one of the best days of my whole ministry there, right? Like, it's just, and people know, like, I've had people text me and say, I know this is your Sabbath, but, and I, I just, part of me wants to murder them, but I just don't look at it and I just don't respond. Other people have texted me and I'll text them the next day and say, hey, sorry for the delay. Yesterday was my Sabbath. Oh, I forgot. I'm so sorry. It, it trains people to say, hey, I'm going to model this biblical behavior. What does sabbatical look like? Sabbatical looks like, first and foremost, detaching completely. When I took my sabbatical, I said to the associate pastor, I said, you have three reasons to call me. I said, um, a staff or council member dies, a staff or council member gets arrested, or the church burns completely to the ground. Partial fire, don't call, right? And we knew, right? And it was no, I mean, I literally gave my phone to my wife for the summer, for those eight weeks. It was awesome. It was so great. I was like, I hate the thing now. You know, like it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so, uh, and, and again, the church I attend right now, I was meeting with the senior staff and we were talking through, you know, confidentially, you know, a staff issue and we're gonna, they're gonna start with the sabbatical. And I said, they're not gonna do well with detaching. And I said, you need to note when you have this conversation that showing up in the office, answering an email is an immediate terminable offense. That's the only way you're gonna get them to honor this. I'm just telling you right now. Uh, and, and so you've got to, you've got to, you've got to force that. Uh, this is a biblical model. This is a healthy model that, you know, if you're a good leader, you should be able to get hit by a bus and the, the people are sad, most of them, never all of them, um, and the church still runs. You should, to be a good leader, you should be able to go on a six-week sabbatical and the church still runs, but people miss you when you come back. Now, if, if they don't miss you, then, you know, 
that's another thing. But, um, you know, the sabbatical needs. Now, some people use sabbatical just for rest. Some people do some continuing ed. Uh, some people do some vacationing. Some people do some educational travel. There's lots of different ways to look at it. Eli Lilly will fund sabbaticals for pastors. Not everyone gets these grants, but you can get like 35 grand to do all these sabbatical activities up to like 35 grand. I mean, people have gone to Israel and, you know, or gone to Ireland. You know, me, when I did my sabbatical, I didn't get the grant. So the first week we went on vacation as a family to Colorado. Well, the first three days I had to learn how to be on sabbatical. Then we went on vacation as family to Colorado. Then I stayed home and I, I'm not good at like construction house stuff. Um, and so I said, I'm gonna learn something new. And so I, ripped up flooring and redid rooms and did all this stuff, even plumbing. And I, like, I didn't even swear as much as I like normally do in real life. And it was just this beautiful thing. I got up when I wanted to get up. I showered when I was stinky, um, you know, and it was, there's, and I read, I just, I caught up on all these stack of books. Right. You know, and then I went and did like a little kind of mini uh, time at a monastery, uh, you know, of silence. Uh, so it looks different. Um, it looks different for, for everyone. And I think when somebody takes a sabbatical, um, it should be, um, you know, it should be designed in a way that forces them to rest, to do something that pours into themselves and to in some way pour into their family. Um, I, a lot of churches I work with, they don't have personnel policies, which no surprising, but blows my mind. And so sabbatical is a part of the personnel policy, you know, and I, I, I tend to be one of the, you know, um, eight weeks for every seven years of service and you can't, and you can pound vacation on top of it, but not continuing ed time without special permission. But I, I, I would, if I could encourage churches to do anything right now, besides look in a mirror on conflict, I would say, build a system over the next year to give every one of your full-time pastors and ministry staff at least a one month sabbatical um, to, to recover from COVID and don't make it optional. Um, you know, it's, and it's gotta be about detaching. Sabbath is not, it, Sabbath is, is where we recognize that A, God doesn't need us. God uses us, but God doesn't need Marcus Carlson to make the kingdom of God happen. He uses Marcus Carlson for some reason to make the kingdom of God happen. And the two, we really need God. It's, Sabbath is an act of obedience. It's an act of worship. Um, it, is, it is saying, you know what? I'm not the Christ. And life and church and ministry uh, can go on without me. I, I do like a whole one hour deal on this because I get real fired up about it. So you're poking at the right questions um, because, yeah. I Listen, I'm a driven guy. I've got, I wear like 18 different hats. I go like, 10, 14 hours a day, but man, I've learned when I stop, I stop and I turn right off and it's awesome. And I'm, a, I'm actually a better person, Christ follower, husband, father, pastor, um, since I've gotten in my Sabbath rhythm and my sabbatical rhythm than I ever was before. And, you know, it turns out that the church has actually survived without me. Jesus is still Lord, even when Marcus takes a day off. It was disappointing at first. Other questions? All right, well, if there's no other questions, I wanna be sensitive to time again. I think, um, you know, uh, Trump, health trumps everything. And any church, any pastor, any leader can, can do health better, but it's, it takes work. It's counter-cultural, it's counter-intuitive, but it's super scriptural. And if we really want to make the biggest impact for the kingdom as individuals, as church communities, uh, we've got to make health a priority. That again, outside of the work of the gospel, um, this is uh, the biggest factor in our longevity and health. And health never happens by accident. Nobody will do it for you. Nobody will do it for your church for you. Nobody will do it for you as a pastor. Um, it, that is so, so critical. And so I just, I just can't encourage you enough. 
um, that my hope and prayer for every pastor in every church, uh, and, and the reason I do what I do now is uh, that we would all have lasting and transformational health, and other than a couple steps backwards here and there, that we would move forward on that spectrum of health, uh, and you know, and we need to do it together. I, you know, one of my jobs at my church, I love being in a church where I'm not on staff, uh, and so it's been a great learning curve, and so one of my volunteer jobs is to be the pastor to the staff, and I love it. But today, I, I've had a little bit of a rough week, you know, just life, right, you know? And so I walked out of the sanctuary or the gym today after second, third service, and I said, that the fan pastor said, hey, so when I asked you how you were doing earlier, I didn't really buy what you were saying. And I said, well, that's good, because it really wasn't, you know, I mean, I, I'm not great. And he said, well, do you want to talk about it? And I said, you know, like, hey, we all got our stuff, just a bump in the road, people have it worse. And he just looked at me and said, fine, but I hope you're sure because if you're not healthy, you can't help us be healthy. Um, and so even for me, right? Like even for me, you know, I've, you know, I've got to catch it. And so this 28 year old kid was telling me what to do today and it was great. It's awesome. Uh, and, and so um, we really do need each other in this. And that's the way that God set up the kingdom. We were built to be in relationship with one another that, that God knew that this thing called life was going to be become difficult, would be difficult, and that throwing in, trying to follow and look more like Jesus every day into the mix, that's also really hard. So, so just a closing thought. Um, I will pray, and then I always stick around for a couple minutes in case there's something else, but appreciate you spending this time with me tonight and your commitment to thinking about the health of yourself, of your leaders, and of your church. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for this chance uh, to gather together, for the beauty of the kingdom, for the beauty of the gift of technology, though it may not always do what we want, it may drive us nuts, it may not feel as real as what we need, it, it allows us to have moments like these. And so God, I pray for each one in this room, for the families, for the ministries, for the churches uh, that they represent, that God, you would help them to move forward in their own health and the health of their ministries and the churches that we would look more and more like you each day, that you would empower us to trust the Holy Spirit more each day, that you would give each of us lasting and transformational health. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks all.